Before we get on to today's program, we just wanted to remind you that today's slides are copyrighted. So this presentation and the corresponding slides are copyrighted by Robson Forensic and may not be recorded, copied, distributed, or otherwise used without our authorization. So having said that, um, we do look for every opportunity that we can to, to use these slides again and, and, to, and to provide the type of presentation that we're giving today to your law firm or your regional legal organization. So if you think that a program like this would be relevant for your group, uh, even if we would need to adjust the content in some way, we really look forward to those opportunities. At the end of the day, we want to engage with our clients. We want you to experience the level of expertise that we have in-house because it will become clear why Robson Forensic is the right choice for your forensic cases. So um, on to today's program. And, and as I said, if, if you were here uh, right at two o'clock when we opened the program, today's topic is a little bit different than what we normally talk about because uh, the topic today is not only relevant to our audience as insurance professionals or as litigators, it's also relevant to us as, as, as humans who go into offices or specifically as uh, business owners who are trying to keep their employees safe. So there's a, there's a lot of different reasons why we might be logged into this. And in line with that, uh, you know, let's, let's broaden um, our field of questions to that point, right? If you have a question on, uh, you know, what, what should be happening with the HVAC system? What should I be doing with my HVAC system? What should I be looking for post exposure if I'm investigating a claim? It's all open for discussion today. And the, uh, the speaker who we have today, I, I think he's, uh, he's got his camera on. Uh, Renee, if you want to turn on your microphone as well. Uh, Renee is a mechanical engineer and, and building systems expert. He's been with Robson Forensic for, it's got to be uh, eight years would be my guess, but I might be off. And, and he, good guess. is it a good guess? Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and he, he's owned his own mechanical engineering um, consulting firm since 1993. Uh, he's a professional engineer in multiple states. He is the right guy to talk about this topic. So I'm excited to introduce you all to Renee Basolto. Renee, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you want to go ahead and share yours. And in, in doing so, if you want to tell us a little bit more about your background, I know I just barely skimmed the surface of your qualifications. Um, and, and tell us a little bit about the type of uh, forensic cases you get involved in as well. I'm sure everybody will be interested to hear about it. Perfect. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name again is Rene Basulto. I am an engineer, a mechanical engineer. I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in engineering management. I also happen uh, to be a general contractor. So I have both sides, the design and the construction uh, component in, in my background and my experience. I do have over 40 years experience in, in the building industry. I actually started off digging ditches uh, in the late 70s for refrigerant lines. So since the inception, it's been uh, HVAC or heating, ventilation, air conditioning has been a, a large part of my experience. And uh, <clears throat> I, I really enjoy that component of it. I'm a professional engineer in multiple states. Um, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is always nice. Uh, I'm actually based out of Florida in the Miami Lakes office. Um, I'm a uh, certified general contractor in the state of Florida, as well as a certified licensed plan examiner and licensed inspector, uh, providing services for uh, different individuals, mostly the school district down here, acting as the building department, uh, reviewing the, uh, documents and uh, doing inspections during construction for compliance with the code. Um, I'm also a uh, member of the Association of Facility Engineers. It's a national organization. And through that organization, I am certified as a plant engineer. Uh, and it's not the green plants, it's the actual industrial plants or plants as far as buildings and maintenance, uh, everything that's related to that. Um, I am an educator uh, at heart, deep at heart. It just doesn't pay as well as this does. But I taught seven years at the University of Miami uh, School of Architecture. I taught uh, building systems uh, at the graduate and undergraduate level, uh, teaching architects uh, how buildings work. 
Um, they design beautiful buildings, but uh, I taught them how to make them work as far as how to design the air conditioning, the ventilation, uh, illumination, uh, acoustics, plumbing systems, fire protection, everything that goes inside the building and makes them work uh, is what I was uh, lecturing and teaching at the University of Miami. Uh, I've, Jesse mentioned I've had my own professional consulting engineering firm, uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering firm since 93. Prior to that, I actually uh, was a partner in another firm uh, for about four years. Uh, we've been designing a, a, a quite uh, diverse and varied uh, types of projects throughout the years, uh, everything from uh, heavy industrial, educational, commercial, uh, even residential. So <clears throat> I'm also a, a, a contractor. I also own and manage a construction company since 2003. Uh, mostly industrial work is, is what we do. We have several projects going on um, <clears throat> every now and then, but it's nothing major. I've been with Robson Forensic full-time for five years and part-time prior to that for, five, for another five years. So I guess when you average it, Jesse, it is about eight years. So you, were, you weren't too far off. I was in the right ballpark, at least. I, I appreciate the right ballpark. So, but uh, within Robson, I am, uh, as Jesse mentioned, a, a, an expert providing um, analysis and testimony in building systems, construction, and fire and explosions. I also manage, happen to manage the, uh, the Gulf states. So everything within that touches the, the Gulf of Mexico, basically, is, is under my, uh, my supervision, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, not that uh, experts need too much supervision in their own, but sometimes it feels like you're hurting cats. But that's another story which we're not getting to today. Um, um, today's agenda, and it, it's a very wide uh, topic. It's a little bit difficult uh, understanding how uh, HVAC or heating, ventilation, air conditioning actually can assist pathogen transmission inside buildings. Uh, to get there, we need to understand how we, how we get there, right? So we're going to look at sick buildings and how they contribute to the spread of airborne pathogens. Um, we're gonna go a little bit into that. Uh, I'm not gonna leave you hanging with just the problem. I'm gonna give you what the solutions are, what the potential solutions are. We're going to look at uh, delusion, filtration, and sanitation. And obviously we'll get more into that. We're also gonna look a little bit into the standard of care as uh, of all the individuals involved, uh, including the owners, um, employers, uh, design team uh, and contractor. So we're going to look at that and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, I'll be around. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> Don't tell the bosses that, Jesse, but uh, I'll be around for as long as you need me. Um, if you have any questions that are um, relevant to a particular slide and you can't wait till the end, go ahead and, and, and put it on the chat like Jesse said. Jesse, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm used to it. I, I still remember when I used to teach the college students. They used to interrupt me all the time. So uh, I can go back into it if you need to. Uh, we'll address it as, as I come along. All right, so what are sick buildings? Uh, or sick building syndrome or tight building syndrome? It goes by several names. And how do we get there? Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, ventilation standards were established when buildings uh, started to be enclosed a little bit more. Uh, during that time, uh, several organizations established that about 15 cubic feet per minute of outside air, fresh air coming in from the outside per occupant of the building uh, should be introduced to the buildings. And that was primarily to dilute and remove body odors. As a result of the 1973 oil embargo, uh, there were several issues that, that happened. And, their nationwide standards that were established that called for the reduction, among other things, the reduction of outdoor, outdoor air, providing only about five CFM per occupant. And that resulted in, in much tighter buildings, not only because they reduced the ventilation rate, but there were other factors involved in, in energy uh, uh, reduction or energy use reduction, better said, uh, whether it be insulation, tightening of windows, that resulted in these tighter buildings. So what we ended up with is inadequately ventilated buildings because we reduced the amount of air that we were introducing into the building. 
and that led to uh, chemical contamination uh, and built up of, of chemicals inside the surfaces because we didn't have enough air uh, coming in to dilute it and ventilate the buildings. And we get uh, other contaminants all coming in from the outside uh, and outdoor sources, plus the biological contaminants um, like the viruses and the bacteria, et cetera, inside the building. So that's, that's how we get there. So what, what is it that we do? The occupants uh, usually have, uh, end up with sluggish behavior, uh, frequent headaches, uh, the, the resistance to viruses and colds is, is reduced as well as lowered. Uh, there's difficulty in concentrating, there's increased absenteeism in the building. Uh, the EPA actually is, estimates that sick building syndrome accounts for about $60 billion uh, of lost revenue per year. Uh, and it's estimated about $220 billion is lost in worker productivity due to absenteeism uh, of, the, of the employees. So, you know, the symptoms include, you know, sore eyes, feeling of suffocation, dry throat, uh, sore throat, coughing, headache, fatigue, among other things, right? So it's, you're, you're basically uh, feeling crappy all the time. That's a technical word, that crappy is a technical word. So uh, originally and, and traditionally, buildings were built not so tight for lack of a better uh, uh, definition, right? They allowed for the air uh, to, to come in and out of the buildings um, while the building was occupied or wasn't, occup or wasn't occupied. And they had usually had natural ventilation. Just the way buildings were built, uh, you would have gaps in, in, in the windows, gaps through the chimney, uh, the, the, the vents, uh, the lights in, in the ceiling were, were, weren't tight. They were allowed air to come in and out. The attics were vented. There were gaps that where air would come in and out and you know, infiltration and exfiltration of the building. So after po uh, the post-energy crisis, uh, we started building these buildings much tighter. And I remember this, I was, I was already working in the field uh, and, and when, when all these standards were, were starting to be implemented, uh, all of a sudden we needed to insulate buildings. We, all of a sudden we needed to reduce the amount of glazing, obviously when we were designing new buildings, reducing the amount of windows to reduce the amount of energy consumption from the air conditioning system because you were able to size the systems a little bit uh, smaller. So we ended up with a much tighter construction uh, the reduced ventilation rates, uh, reduced openings. Uh, and I mean, even nowadays, you'll see buildings that we're basically wrapping them in, in, in saran wrap. You know, you'll see the construction where you'll have vapor barriers wrapping the buildings completely tight to prevent any air or moisture coming in, in and out of the building. So that ends in a higher concentration or part per million of contaminants, allergens, and pathogens within the building. So what happens when, when we have that type of building? Uh, you're stuck with whatever you put into the building. So in the particular case, when you're looking at droplets containing viruses, whether it be large or small, they will tend to linger in the space and will tend to stay within the space and will concentrate within this occupied space. So with ventilation, even if it's inadequate, you know, proper ventilation, you do get a little bit of, of, of circulation of that. You get a little bit of dilution but with adequate ventilation, you do get a lot more dilution of not only the, the virus contaminants or, or, or any pathogens, but you get a reduction in any contaminants within the building, any allergens or any VOCs within the building. Uh, you'll get that with adequate ventilation. So this is when you don't have that ventilation, uh, this graph will show you that you, you'll get the contaminants, especially in the area where, where, the, where the occupants are uh, because their occupants alone are re releasing the, the, the contaminants or you have sources of contaminants, whether it be cooking or some type of production or some type of, 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 of you know, hoods for, for hazardous conditions, you will get that accumulation as well if you don't have adequate ventilation. Uh, just so you have an idea of, of this graph, I can explain a little bit. This would be outdoor air coming in. This would be your equipment that's moving the air, the air handling equipment with either heating or cooling coils or both, uh, distributing the air, and this will be the air coming back and, and being relieved. If you have too much of that air, not enough of the outside air, is when you end up with inadequately ventilated buildings. So it's, so, so what do we do? Well, we have a problem, we've identified the problem, what do we do with a sick building? So it's like, we approach it like any other hazard in the forensic industry, right? 
if we think of the of a sick building as a hazard and we think of the built up of contaminants in the building as a hazard we want to go to the hierarchy of controls on how to reduce or eliminate a hazard and uh, from the most effective to least effective uh, the most effective would be elimination and, and it's quite curious to see that how we're handling the virus uh, and the pandemic in this country everybody's concentrating down here in the least effective not that it's not effective but we're everybody's concentrating and putting a lot of emphasis in the PPE the personal uh, protective equipment and in the administrative control which is you know changing the way people work, changing the way people act, changing the where people go. So we seem to be concentrating on this, where we need to, as, as we need to look more into how do we eliminate it completely within the building. You know, it's fine to go eat outdoors, but uh, in South Florida where we are, it's getting a little bit nicer now, but you know, a month ago, or two ago, uh, between the, the heat, humidity and mosquitoes, it was not very nice to go eat outdoors. Uh, at, at, at restaurants, so we need to look at uh, at how we can we can eliminate those uh, the potential hazard. And uh, the solution, obviously, the best solution will be to eliminate it. Uh, in, in 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 a perfect world, you would overhaul the buildings to bring in as much outside air as you can, and move all that air out so to the point where you would almost be outside. However, that's very impractical. It's been practical that all facilities will overhaul their buildings. Uh, it, it, we need to look at, and when I say we, I mean us as a, as a design, uh, as design professionals, as building owners, as contractors, the entire team needs to look at a cost-effective approach to this, to achieve this solution. Uh, fortunately, um, that doesn't necessarily mean overhauling everything. You, we are looking at, possibly just minor modifications, uh, increased system maintenance or <laughs> maintenance period. Uh, I mean, you'd be surprised when, we go to, when I go to some of these buildings on how poorly maintained they are. And you're looking at system calibration, something as easy as put, going back and adjusting the building to operate the way it was designed to operate should be sometimes enough to handle and, and, and alleviate a sick building syndrome or alleviate uh, the, the, the concentration of, of pathogens and contaminants within the building. Uh, when we look at it on a forensic approach, uh, when we're not analyzing a building post-exposure, uh, we are gonna look at these things. I'm, as an engineer, as a forensic engineer, I'm going to look at, uh, was there adequate maintenance? Uh, was the system properly calibrated? Was it balanced properly? Was there enough air going in to the spaces that they needed to go in? Uh, we'll look and compare uh, to the to the existing drawings or the original design and the design intent to see if it's being met uh, and any, any modifications were done to the system that are preventing the system or the equipment from achieving that. And we'll look at what uh, reasonable modifications have been applied to the building. Has the building owner, has the, the, the employer made reasonable modifications to the building itself, the, the, the indoor environment, whether it be through the air conditioning system, whether it be to, to in the cleaning process and maintenance, has that been applied? Has, have they done what they needed to do or have they done anything at all to, to accommodate and to reduce this hazard that, that is all now very well known? So the, the first solution and I touched on it briefly was delusion, and uh, again, if we bring in, we're looking at this. If we, if all this air, we bring in all this outside air, we just dump it straight into the space, and we exhaust all of the in indoor air out. It'd be great, assuming you have decent outdoor air to begin with, right? That's another topic we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. So th that would completely reduce the contaminants, will reduce the pathogen transmission, but it has certain limitations. First of all, the energy cost uh, to treat this outdoor air, uh, because uh, aside from maybe a couple of days in here in South Florida, uh, we really can't bring in outdoor air without doing anything to it. And in most places throughout the country, you really can't bring in outdoor air when it's 30 degrees outside, bring it into the building without treating it somehow or heating it somehow. So we're, we're doing that, but the cost of treating that air uh, tends to be very expensive 
tends to be very high. Uh, there are conditions and situations that, and, and we design buildings uh, and, and spaces where we have 100% outdoor air coming in. There are certain spaces that are required to do that. First one that comes to mind is, is a surgical operating room. That is definitely one that you want to bring in um, a, a significant amount, if not all outdoor air. Uh, there are, are, they are our production, uh, industrial production, pharmaceutical uh, production facilities where we bring in 100% outdoor air because you don't want to have that contamination. We're, there are other facilities, I mean, we just finished designing um, an, a quarantine intake facility for the Greater Miami Humane Society where we're bringing in 100% outdoor air, not so much to, to, to prevent transmission, but to control the odors inside the space, right? You don't want to be recirculating that air. In that particular space, we were um, maintaining negative pressure in the quarantine rooms to, to ensure that nothing that these animals are bringing in could be transmitted to the other rooms where the other animals were. So we're bringing 100% outside air, we were exhausting all of it. We were making sure that the pressure differentials between the rooms were adequate, where what the air from one room would not pass into the other one. Uh, and, and very similar to that, and, and I've designed hospitals that where this is a good example because I just finished, we just finished designing it. Uh, we're actually going to start building it through my construction company with a design build project. But hospitals are built the exact same way. Isolation areas and isolation rooms are depending on the type of isolation room. If it's, it's, it's a contaminant uh, disease uh, isolation room, you want to make sure that the room is under negative pressure where uh, no air from that room is going to the other spaces. If it's another type of room or a clean isolation room, you want to pressurize that room to prevent any air to come into that room where it might be somebody who is immune, immune compromised or a very delicate position that anything could, could affect them. So there are both ways. Hospitals are designed that way. But you can't expect your typical building to be designed that way uh, because it's cost prohibitive to bring in 100% outdoor air. And I've been delivering that issue for a while. I'll keep going. So, and the, the equipment cost is quite expensive as well. Um, but the, the main limitation is in a lot of these existing buildings, the equipment doesn't have the capacity to handle that additional outdoor air. It doesn't have the cooling capacity, doesn't have the heating capacity to treat the additional outdoor air that's being brought in. So you know, the other thing that I mentioned briefly was the quality of that outdoor air. If you're next to a highway and, and your building is right next to a highway, you may not want to bring in 100% outdoor air. You actually may want to reduce the amount of air that's bringing in and you want to look at other options, whether it be extra filtration, et cetera. And again, I already mentioned the limitations of the equipment uh, not having adequate capacity. So we go back to this graphic and, and what does adequate ventilation do for us? And when we see here, when we don't have adequate ventilation, you have that stagnation of within the space, you have accumulation and higher concentrations of contaminants, whether they be uh, VOCs, whether they be uh, pathogens, whatever it may be. And, and you'll see that concentration of space in an improperly ventilated building. Uh, when you are introducing the building is properly balanced and they're designed to control this, you will end up with a much better indoor environment. So, um, since we have those limitations, uh, we need to look at other areas because that may not be sufficient to take care of our building and, and bring it up uh, to a safe, bring, it, bring us to a safe environment. So the other option we have uh, is filtration. Um, filtration requires routine maintenance. Uh, you may have the filtration in place already. It just hasn't been properly maintained. Again, it, it still amazes me. I go into buildings and, and I'll see these filters, which are, are, you can barely have any air go through them and you ask the, the, the building management or the building owners, you know, when's the last time you changed the filter? And they look at you like, you know, what's a filter? So, but it does require routine maintenance. Um, you, you need to look at the effectiveness of the filters. And again, the filtration has its limits as well. Um, the, the filters, the original purpose of the filters uh, was actually to protect the equipment. 
It was to protect the equipment from, let me move this out of the way a second ago. Excuse me. All right, that's not gonna work. All right, here we go. All right, sorry. I was adjusting my screen so I could see it. Um, the original um, purpose of the filters inside the an equipment was to protect the equipment itself. Remember, air has to go across a coil, some type of, of, of either an evaporator coil, a heating coil, depending on what your system is doing, whether you're heating or cooling, but those tend to be fairly tight fins. So if you start getting dust and, and pollen and, and hair and, and all sorts of stuff that, that are drawn into the air, you're gonna end up clogging those coils, you're gonna end up uh, making uh, the, the system much less effective, much less um, productive in, in, in cooling or heating, whatever you're doing. So that's the original intent of the filters. There are many different types of filters. Um, everybody's perhaps is used to hearing the, the, the term HEPA, whether it be vacuum cleaners or, or air purifiers, et cetera. Uh, high efficiency particulate air filters are a very effective way to filter out air. Um, this is what you see here is, is a typical example of a HEPA filter. Um, this, what you see here that I'm pointing to, and hopefully everybody can see it, is your typical uh, filter that you would find inside your, the, any unit in, in your home or any like commercial unit. Uh, this here would be an, an example of a, of a higher efficiency filter that's used in Mer MERV 13. I'll get into what, what that means in a little bit. But the, the, the more efficient the filters are, the more resistance you have to the air going across them. I mean, if you think about it, that's what the filters do. They, they prevent stuff from going through them. They're filtering out the air. So the more efficient, the more effective the filter are, the more resistance you have to the airflow. And that's something that needs to be taken into account when we're looking at modifying our systems and increasing the filtration. Not every piece of equipment can handle it. So the filters are rated, uh, and so for comparison, MERV, which is a minimum efficiency reporting value, uh, is a measurement scale uh, that was established by the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration, uh, Refrigeration Air Conditioning Engineers, or ASHRAE, uh, to report on the effectiveness of filters. Your traditional filter is a, more, a MERV 4 filter. Um, that's what comes inside your, your unit in your house or, or any light commercial unit. You'll see the, the efficiencies out here. And, and what they what they um, what they'll block right the MERV four will take care of you know lint pollen um, you know bugs sawdust all you know larger materials but you, in the lower size of particles you see that it's very ineffective and not effective at all so the the MERV thirteen is what's now being recommended you'll see that it's a much higher efficiency effectiveness uh, and that will, will filter out bacteria, tobacco smoke, talcum dust, and a lot lighter, far smaller particles. It's a 90 uh, on the particle range of three to 10 microns, you have 90% or better efficiency. And even the very small point, point 0.3 to one micron, you have a very large uh, about 20, effectiveness when it comes to filtering out the, the particles in the, in the air. Now, Renee, if, if you can go back to that previous slide for just one moment for the, you know, the interest that we have in, in what is 2020, the um, viruses and bacteria, which, which uh, category do they tend to fall in, in in terms of size? The actual virus itself, the, the, the COVID-19 virus is actually, I think, a point one or point oh eight or something, which would be smaller than this, but you have to understand that that's being carried in a in a droplet, which is a much larger size. So mm -hmm. this is effective in filtering that out. Very good question. Um, it, it is effective, and and I have, if you bear with me, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into how we can take care of what's left and what gets through, which is part of the issue with filtration is that you can't catch everything, and. Uh, this out of the way again. Here we go. All right. So that we go back to the limitations that we were talking about. There's a reduction in airflow because we have a much higher resistance. 
there, there's equipment limitations because you already have existing equipment that the fan and the motor that drives the fan are already sized for a particular resistance. So if you start increasing the resistance, you end up with the chance that the motor and the fans don't have the capability of moving the air that you need to move. Now, you're saying, okay, we'll have a little bit less air. But you remember you're sizing, uh, the equipment is sized with a particular size of coil uh, for a particular amount of air. If you start reducing the amount of air through there, particularly in the cooling season, you're going to end up with, end up freezing your coil and drains and leakage and a bunch of other stuff, which is not fun at all, right? Uh, this, this graph actually gives us a better idea of, of what we're looking at and how the systems operate. You'll see here, they're calling a pre-filter. In, in your regular system, you'll have, this will be your regular MERV-13, hopefully filter. Uh, this system is serving, uh, is designed to serve something a little bit more, that has a little bit more need for, for additional filtration. It will have a bag filter section right after it. Bag filters are, are very high efficiency type filters. Again, how filters work is they, they, they work on surface area and the, how to impact the most amount of surface area of the filter with the air. So the bag filters extend that surface area and they, they strain out the, 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 the particulates in the air. So, but again, that re offers a lot of resistance to the airflow. And the typical unit will have either a cooling coil and a heating coil, which uh, cool the air or heat the air as it goes through, and then it's discharged down into the space or throughout the space. So, but again, we're looking at energy costs because of the additional resistance. The higher resistance, the more energy uh, the, the fans will use and the motors will use to move the air. And we have that limitation that, you know, answering that question is the, the submicron, the stuff that gets through uh, the filter that, that can't be completely filtered out. So those are the limitations we have for filtration. So we need to look at something else, right? If, if, if the delusion and filtration aren't doing it, um, we need to look at what we do with the stuff that's filtered through. What do we do with the submicron particles, sorry, that, that have been able to get through. So one, one very uh, e effective solution that, that has been brought up um, is the, the ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, or UV, U, U, uh, UVGI. I, I said the whole word easier than the acronym. So anybody who's been out in the sun, uh, understands that the UV rays or the light will degrade organic material. That's how we end up with sun. Um, so given the proper contact time and intensity, right, we need to have the amount of time and the intensity of, of, of under, while we're exposed to that light, the UV light can and will inactivate viruses or bacteria, rendering them harmless. So this is catching whatever went through and went through the coil it's catching it and hopefully rendering it harmless and reducing that risk. So that, that's the end, the end, uh, end result or the end goal is to reduce that hazard. So this is, is doing it. So there, there are a lot of novel approaches with the UV uh, sanitizers. Um, there are a lot of in-room sanitizers. Um, they, they've been around for a while. You'll see them, it's a, it's, a, it's a blue light. If you go to any supermarket in the meat section, uh, you will see if you notice, I noticed because I designed supermarkets before and I know they're there because we put them in. You'll notice in the meat packing, in the meat cutting department, you'll notice wall mounted uh, like blue black lights. Those are UV uh, sanitizers for in, in the room. So they've been around for a while. It's nothing new. Um, the, the, the most application we had for these lights before, since they kill the bacteria and they inactivate bacteria and viruses, they, they were used to keep the coils clean, to prevent any bacteria growth within the coil and within the drain pan to keep the drain pans clean, et cetera. However, since th this has been known to be so effective, uh, the, the biggest use now has been for sanitation of the airstream itself. It's almost like a byproduct of the, of the, of, of the process, but uh, the demand is out there. Um, uh, you'll also see a, a lot of, uh, that I haven't been seeing them lately, but when the whole pandemic started, you would see like robots going into rooms, into, into hospital rooms and turning on the UV lights. And I saw one where they were walking a, a UV light generator down the aisle of an airplane and they were irradiating all the seats in, in the airplane. So it's a very effective solution. 
Um, and the good news about it is, is it's, it's a fairly cost effective solution. Um, I, this isn't a picture of why I put in. This one comes from UV Resources, which is one of the manufacturers. Just happens to be the manufacturer of the one that I'm using. Uh, we have a 20 ton air conditioning system here in our office. And I installed one of these inside, well, a system of these very similar to this four lights, like this inside the unit to uh, before we started with the pandemic. I ordered it uh, right before Labor Day. Uh, it took a month for the parts to get here. There's a huge demand. There's a huge backlog at the factories of not only UV resources, but on most of them. So it, it's kind of hard to get, uh, but it's a very effective um, uh, way uh, to sanitize. There are different types of UV lights, UVA, B, and C. UVC is the most effective in the germicidal uh, realm. They're, they're closer to the x-rays. So it's, uh, it, it's quite effective, very cost effective. Um, the, the one I installed in the office, uh, materials alone were, I think it was like $1,800, $2,000. Uh, installation was cheap because I installed it myself, but obviously you're not gonna have that benefit. But uh, the, the, there are huge advantages to it. It can destroy the microorganisms like mold, bacteria, and germs. Um, you can apply it in a room-based air handling system. Uh, it, it, it'll clean the coils, it'll keep the drains clean. Um, the disadvantage is that it doesn't filter out contaminants from the space, but you're not relying on this to filter out the contaminants. You're using the filtration to filter out contaminants. Uh, this picture that we have here, Jesse, that's a new one that you didn't see before when we showed you a slide. That's actually a picture of uh, one of the air conditioning units in my, in my house. So I actually, in addition to putting it in, my, in, in the office, uh, I was able to uh, obtain and install a, a UV light for my air handler in my house. And again, this cost me $125. That's contractor cost. And it, it, it's a kit that comes with, with, all you need is a drill basically, a drill and a screwdriver and, and a power source at the unit. Um, all you need, I drilled the hole, installed it myself, very easy to install. All you need is, is to connect it. And these lights stay on all the time. They don't turn on and off with the air handler. They stay on all the time, irradiating the surfaces, making sure that the, the surface of the coil, the surface of the, of the drain pan, the water of the drain pan stays clean and there's no bacteria uh, growth within, within it. So it's, it's, it was quite fun. All right, the other solution that, that's out there, although ASHRAE has actually stayed silent in their latest uh, position paper, is bipolar ionization. Bipolar ionization, it, it's, it's a, um, electrical and chemical process, excuse me, where it uh, generates ions and charges the, the air particles with the ions and those ions pump up and, and then are filtered out. So uh, there's a little additional pressure drop uh, that's added to the system, which is a huge advantage. You're not looking at the energy cost of, of moving it. It's easily uh, installed. Uh, it requires no re-engineering of the existing system. You can plug it into any system. Uh, big disadvantages, um, uh, there's a lot of wear and calibration uh, that's required of the emitters. Um, it, it only captures particles that uh, from, from the ducted air. It's not, it doesn't work within the space. And there's a potential of uh, ozone discharge into, into the space. It's a, uh, ozone is actually a byproduct. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, we do a lot of work on uh, my engineering side, we do a lot of work for the school district, and we do a lot of, uh, most of the plan review and, and inspections for the school district, so we review other engineers. Uh, and we assist the district in, in developing their criteria. Uh, their criteria post-pandemic, uh, they were actually installing these bipolar ionization uh, units inside the, the air handlers and, and air distribution systems in their schools in an effort to reduce the amount of outside air into the buildings. Again, remember I said that outside air equates to energy cost. So they were trying to reduce the energy cost by reducing the amount of outside air and they were using the bipolarization to justify and perhaps clean the air out um, to reduce that outside air. Um, we're rethinking that right now. So. <laughs> 
I, I'm actually, I was at a conference uh, with, with the, uh, the administrators of maintenance of the school district, uh, looking at that, uh, my office has three schools uh, renovations that we're, we're doing, which included replacement of units. And uh, they were pushing us just to put the bipolar, reduce the air. I told them absolutely not. Uh, they were resistant at first. Once I explained to them what they were looking at and the potential liability they were looking at, uh, they all agreed. And uh, they're looking to, to change their criteria with respect to that. So what are we looking at sanitation, comparing both of these uh, items? And, and, and I put the graphic up here so I can explain how they work and where they work, right? So this is the outside air coming into the air handling unit. Uh, this would be the return air from your space. These two mix in here. Hopefully it's enough outside air coming in to afford a, a, a viable dilution inside the space. That's filtered out, whether it be a, a, a MER 13 or higher or, or lower if your unit can handle it. That's filtered out, it goes through a heating coil and we'll have the UV light, UVC light uh, hitting the, the cooling coil which is where the, the bacteria tends to accumulate because of the moisture in the, in the cooling coil. So you'll have that irradiating the, coil, irradiating the coil and at the same time irradiating all the surfaces and the air within that space that comes across and it'll go through a, to your fan, pushing the air. This particular system has a final filtration or HEPA filter, which is very common in, uh, in industrial clean rooms, uh, production clean rooms where you need a clean environment. Uh, whether you're mixing chemicals, you're mixing pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, uh, and so you'll have some more additional UV uh, irradiation at this point to keep that uh, surface of that coil, of that coil, sorry, of the fan. Uh, let me slow down so I can get the right word out, right? Of the filter, <laughs> keeping the surface of the filter irradiated and clean, full of bacteria, uh, free from bacteria and viruses. So that, that will be the UV line and how it's applied. And you'll see that you, know, you're, you have to get into the unit itself to get it in and it requires a little bit of work. The bipolar ionization is a bit simpler um, process. You still have your same unit, uh, the same process inside the unit. And this is basically just a, a device. You have your bipolar emitter at the discharge inside the ductwork where you're just basically plugging it, plugging it in and that's ionizing the air coming across and uh, hopefully uh, neutralizing bacteria in, in, within the space, bacteria, viruses, whatever it may be. All right, um, so let's get into the standard of care that, that we're looking at when it comes to, to, to what we have here. Um, HVAC systems, uh, as you can tell, can either be a blessing or a curse when it comes to disease transmission and infection control. Uh, in fact, according to ASHRAE, ASHRAE again is the, the, the be all end all of the air conditioning industry. Uh, the transmission of infectious airborne diseases like tuberculosis, like influenza, the common cold, um, and, and obviously COVID falls into this space, can be accelerated or controlled by a building's HVAC system. Basically, in other words, the same system that circulates the air throughout your space and your building. Uh, is also circulating the bacteria and diseases like measles and tuberculosis, Q fever, and, and uh, the COVID-19. So in 2014, again, prior to pandemic, <laughs> ASHRAE issued a position document on airborne infectious diseases. Uh, and in that document, they noted that uh, the foundation for any infection control strategy begins with a well-designed, installed, commissioned, and maintained HVAC system. Now I bolded that, that's a straight quote out of ASHRAE because it, it points to all of the players. Well designed, you're looking at the design team. Installed, you're looking at the contractor. Commissioned, you're looking at both the contractor, the commissioning, uh, commissioning agent, and the design team, depending on their involvement. And maintained, which is usually the, the worst one or, or the, the biggest culprit, uh, you're looking at building owners. Uh, you're looking at building owners, management companies, whoever's maintaining or managing that, that building or, or space. So uh, said different, the air conditioning system is ground zero <laughs> when it comes to reducing disease transmission or accelerating disease transmission. Um, a, a sad note, um, I, I actually had a uh, 
services for, for a gentleman who was an acquaintance of mine. I actually knew his son or her son-in-law better than him, but he worked uh, in an office building not too far from our office here in Miami Lakes. Uh, during the pandemic, he was uh, a, not necessarily a healthcare worker, but he worked in that industry. He was very careful not to bring anybody into his space, but the bottom floor of his building um, occupied a bank and people were still coming in and out of the bank and um, him and several other individuals in the building uh, contracted COVID without any exposure to anybody, to any other individuals. So, it, and we're looking into it now, but the, the, only, uh, the only connection between him and the other individuals in the building was that they shared a component of the air conditioning system. So that right now that's what it's looking like it was. Uh, it's very sad, he was trying to protect himself he wasn't that elderly, he was in the 70s, but uh, uh, still, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sad that it could have been prevented if the air conditioning system uh, would have been working properly. So, or if, I guess if they, if they would have known better, uh, I guess. So uh, looking, at, at, uh, looking at that standard of care that ASHRAE has developed, uh, ASHRAE again develops these standards in a consensus-based uh, approach from all, the, all its members. Uh, it's an international organization. Um, prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the filter recommendations that they had in their, in their uh, <clears throat> that they were recommending was BRF6 filters. Remember BRF6, very close to four, which really didn't filter out much other than the, the dust and the pollen and, and maybe a just a little bit more efficient than the BRF4. Um, they were recommending, ASHA recommends between seven and a half to 15 CFM per person ventilation rate in the buildings. And they would recommend to run the HVA system when the building is occupied, right? The new position paper that they have, uh, which became effective or was issued April 14th of 2020, just right after we, we understood what was going on with, with the pandemic, is that they are saying, and this is from, from their the position paper, MER 13 or the highest achievable filters uh, that you can install in your system. Um, remember, we're talking about the, 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 uh, the limitation of the system. It could be that you can't get a 13 in there. I actually ended up putting 13 filters in my house uh, and in, in the office. Uh, I will tell you that the 13s, the, the air handlers in my house are struggling a little bit. Um, fortunately, they have um, the motors that they have uh, are variable in that they will increase with the resistance uh, that, that they're looking at, so they will ramp up. And the reason I know they're struggling is because they're running a lot faster. You can hear them revving up a lot more with the 13 filters. I just need to be careful, make sure that, um, to, to keep them as clean as possible so they don't struggle as much. But I think it's a small price to pay to ensure that the air inside our house is, 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 is a better, air, better environment in, in our home. And in our office, we have the same thing here in the office. So <clears throat> that's one. Uh, ASHRAE now is recommending that you increase the ventilation rate as conditions permit. Again, remember the limitations. You, equipment will not have sufficient capacity to handle too much of the outside air increase. Uh, in the office, I was able to increase, well, actually able to double it because it was, it was significantly reduced at the intake. I was able to open up the intake and it, it seems to be functioning fine. It's been functioning like this, you know, for several months and when we went through the summer and didn't feel any effect inside the building as far as temperature control. So we were able to increase it significantly. The other item is that they're saying to keep the systems running longer 24 seven as possible. Again, this is an energy uh, issue. The longer you run it, the more, you know, it's gonna cost but the, the idea there is to continue to move the air, to continue to dilute the indoor space, and to, to keep that air moving and cleaning out that air with the filtration and with whatever else you're adding to it. Uh, actually, actually, in the position paper, uh, recommends adding UV GI uh, devices to the system. Uh, it's quite, it's, it's very silent when it comes to bipolarization. Don't know why, uh, but that's, well, the way the position paper stands. Um, bipolar is effective, perhaps not as effective. 
One other item which is which is was interesting, I found interesting in the position paper, is they're saying go ahead and bypass all ERVs. ERVs are energy recovery ventilators um, because some of these could leak uh, the contaminant from the exhaust back to the supply. ERVs usually what the ERVs are, they take the ex air that you're exhausting from your building and in a heat exchanger, uh, they will pre-treat with that air that you're exhausting, they will pre-treat the air that's coming in. Some ERVs will have a cross-contamination component uh, in there. Um, I know this, it depends on which one you use. Uh, we, in, in the, the, um, the dog facility or the intake facility, we just did for the animal shelter, we put it one in, but we made sure that the, the heat exchanger doesn't allow for that cross-contamination. So there are different types. But I, I just found that interesting that they had that in there. So standard of care, where, where are we looking at, right? Um, the uh, International Property Maintenance Code establishes minimum maintenance standards for, for basic equipment, lighting, ventilation, heating, all sorts of stuff, and that identifies who's responsible for it. Uh, it actually says that the owner is responsible for this. So with, from the code, we, we get that it's a responsibility of the owner uh, of the structure to, to provide and maintain the required mechanical facilities. That means you need to maintain the facilities, uh, you need to maintain the air conditioning systems, you need to maintain a system that's properly uh, sized with sufficient capacity, filtration, et cetera. Owners and operators, which include employers, right, are required to maintain a minimum level of safety and sanitation for both the public, <clears throat> sorry, general public and the occupants of the structure. So there's a requirement there, there's a responsibility on behalf of the owners and the operators uh, that, that are operating the business within the building uh, to maintain that level of safety. Uh, and, and now we have the knowledge of how to do it. So it's their responsibility to ensure that that's done, okay? The interior of the structure and its equipment must be maintained as not to adversely affect the occupant's health and safety. I mean, that goes beyond saying, right? The occupants shall, be, shall keep the part of the structure they occupy for control in a clean and sanitary condition. That goes for the occupants as well. It could be the employer, it could be the, the other occupants within the building. So there's, there's a shared responsibility there as well. So a holistic approach needs to be taken uh, when evaluating the readiness of uh, the built environment, the indoor environment for reoccupation in a post-COVID-19 world. You know, an in-depth, detailed evaluation of the existing air conditioning system or heating ventilation air conditioning system needs to be done. Uh, um, and an owner can't be expected to do this, uh, can't be expected to have the knowledge that so they need to get a competent professional uh, to look at their buildings before they're completely occupied. So that, that's where the responsibility comes in with respect to the owners, managers, and facility operators. Okay. Now, looking at the other individuals in, involved in this team, in this issue, uh, the engineering design, architectural design team has certain responsibilities. I mean, they, they were supposed to have designed this building to begin with uh, to be a safe environment, right? So we're looking at, uh, when we're analyzing this, we're gonna be looking at, were there any design deficiencies? Was the building provided with adequate ventilation? Was the building provided with adequate filtration? Was the building provided with equipment uh, and, and, and proper air distribution strategies that would allow for proper dilution. Uh, those are, are all design deficiencies. We're gonna look at the design errors, omissions on the documents, uh, and improper construction administration. Perhaps they designed it properly, but never bothered to ensure that it was done uh, in accordance with their documents. They didn't administer the construction if they were hired to do so. That's a little bit of a gray area that we get into, or I get into whenever I do either uh, design deficiency or construction defect type cases. It all depends on what the contractual obligations were. But nonetheless, uh, that's a, a key component. And <clears throat> adequate, inadequate commission. Uh, if the buildings were designed properly and installed and the equipment was installed properly, but never started up properly and were never balanced properly, that goes to the commissioning agent, goes to the design team that has a responsibility to ensure that is done. And it goes, again, to the contractor was the next issue we're looking at. Uh, the contractor has a responsibility to build things properly and ensure the equipment is installed properly. 
Uh, we'll look at their construction defects if there are any. We'll look at poor workmanship that, that allows, that has allowed for uh, uh, an, insa uh, an unsafe building. Uh, we'll look at inadequate tests and balance when they're putting the system together. We'll look at inadequate commissioning, which includes the tests and balance and inadequate starting of the system. That's, that's what we'll look at when, when it comes to those components. So it's, it's, it's a very wide range uh, of areas that we will be looking at and I anticipate uh, a lot of work in this area, uh, uh, not only evaluating, but, but uh, assisting either uh, plaintiffs or people that were injured or building owners uh, or even design teams and, and or contractors. So uh, it looks like I might be a little bit busy. Uh, hopefully nobody will get hurt, but uh, nonetheless, uh, my father-in-law has a saying that says, uh, that uh, he had a friend who was an undertaker. He says, listen, I don't want people to die, but I want my business to prosper. So, you know, I don't want people to get hurt, but I would like to have a little bit more case work. With that, I'm done with the presentation. Uh, you can, this is my contact information. Uh, I have a couple of articles. Feel free to go in and look at my articles on, on, on this subject. I have a couple of articles on Legionella transmission as well. Um, go free to look at it on our website. Um, I am, Obviously, I would say obviously, hopefully you think I'm qualified to handle anything that, that you might be able to throw at me. Uh, I'm not the only one. Robson has a, a huge uh, uh, staff of, 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 of very capable engineers throughout the country who are able to help you wherever you are. And uh, we're here to help. Uh, I will take any answer, uh, questions and hopefully have the right answers for you. Wonderful. So, Renee, thank you. Th this has been really informative for me. Um, and I know that the time that we've spent preparing for it has really broadened my knowledge. Uh, we had a question that came in, and let me see if I can characterize this fairly, um, because it, this one I think is relevant to, to all of us because we're, we're, all, uh, we're all occupants of buildings, right? And I think we're, many of us manage uh, a, a building if we're homeowners or, or especially if we're business owners. But for, for existing structures, we essentially have three variables that we're looking at. We're looking at the, the dilution, the filtration, and the sanitation, if, if I've understood this correctly. Is there any, um, any guidance in terms of, of which is going to be a more accessible or more, uh, more likely uh, solution for the average business? Or, or is, it, is it going to vary uh, from, from instance to instance every time? Uh, any any rules of thumb, so to speak? Uh, rules of thumb is try to do as much as you can, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at what you did to to make uh, modifications or adequate modifications. Now, if, if you have somebody who's come in and evaluated your building and, and tells you, listen, your out there was closed. If you open it up, your system has capacity to handle this much more. Do that. You should be more than more than adequate. That may be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Don't need additional, but but the, the cost of the filters and is is nothing. If your system can handle the added resistance of a little bit higher efficient filter, even if it's not a 13, put it in an eight, put it in a 10. If but if your system can handle a 13, go ahead and put it in. The cost is not much more than a regular filter. I paid uh, at my house. I paid a, a dozen filters of no 13s. I think it was eighty dollars for for a dozen. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not much. The UV lights are really, in the grand scheme of things, are not, you know, I mean, how much is it going to cost you to litigate? <laughs> or what, not even looking at litigating, how much, you know, just the, the, the burden that you have that there could have been something you did and you didn't do it and, and somebody got sick, right? I mean, even just the lost productivity of somebody being sick. What's the lost productivity that you have, even if they don't get sick? I mean, look at the productivity of, of the employees. I mean, it's, if, if they can, you can get more productivity out. I mean, in, in a week, if you can get a little bit higher, five, 10% productivity out of the workers, you're paying for the filters and you're paying for the, for the UV lights. It's really nothing. Uh, it, it's almost a no brain. Right. So, so the um, major cost is when you're bringing in that outdoor air, which is a little bit more energy, but you know, it, it's needed. Yeah. Uh, Renee, we, we did just have a question come in from, from William here and he's asking, uh, so with COVID in the case example you cited, um, and I, I think I know the answer to this, um, 
how do you believe you can prove that the building's HVAC system was the source uh, of the exposure as opposed to some other place? And I, I think what, what we're looking at in these cases is going to be the whether or not the building owner or the, or the property manager satisfied the standard of care as opposed to um, confirming the, the path of exposure. But, but do, you have, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same approach that, that I would use in, in a legionnaire exposure cases, right? Uh, it, it's coming from somewhere. We need to analyze, we need to go in, we investigate and, and see where the source is. I mean, it, it, not that it helps, God, <laughs> but especially in legionnaires, for example, it, you know, if you have one person that's saying, I got it from this building, you don't have that much of a, a strong of a case. Mm -hmm. But if you have five individuals that got sick in the same time period, and they were all if the only link. The only thing that links them is that building. Uh, you have a much stronger case uh, to look at at, uh, at where it's coming from. And as a professional, we will go in and see where it is. And in this particular building that I that I spoke of uh, before, uh, the only link was because they weren't even in the same office. The individuals that got sick weren't even in the same office. The only link was the building itself. And uh, the only building in the link that would be able to transmit it would be the air conditioning system uh, through, through the building. Um, I haven't been hired. Um, I don't know if they're going to litigate, but uh, it would be a process of going in and analyzing the building itself and determining what, you know, what, what it was, uh, especially if it didn't make any modifications whatsoever. So Legionnaire cases are the same. I, I, I've done both sides. I mean, I've done defense cases and I've done plaintiff cases where, where and I defended properties. Uh, I had a hotel in, in Tennessee, which uh, had two or three individuals that had gotten sick. And, and I went to the building, we're blaming the plumbing system. I went to the building, we did sampling of the water, we did a swabbing of the devices, of the shower heads, and we couldn't find anything, uh, no, no hot spots. But I mean, it, it was when I went out there and you need to think outside the box. You know, I noticed that right next door to the parking lot of the hotel was a, a cement mixing facility. And if you're familiar with cement mixing facilities, they'll have these big piles of, of rock and dust, uh, uh, sand, et cetera. And they usually have a sprinkler system to wet it down to prevent the, the transmission of dust. Well, the sprinklers were exposed piping. Uh, they were heated by the sun. The piping stood stagnant in the pipes for two or three days before it was used. And uh, just by coincidence, I was standing in the parking lot and the sprinklers went out. And sure enough, the mist from the sprinklers ran right over the parking lot straight to the building. So, and you know, that's, that's where we left that one. I mean, that's, that was the source. So you need to look at the source uh, in, in a situation where we have this transmission. Uh, you need to look at the source. You need to see what the link is. I mean, we're, we're the investigators. I do this all the time. Uh, we'll go in and investigate and, and analyze, and usually, for the most part, we will find the source, and we will find that link uh, between the building or, or the lack of link between the building and, in like the, the Legionnaire case that I had, between the hotel and the occupants that got sick. Yeah. Heck of an argument for spending some time on site, that, that case yeah. you did in Tennessee. Um, so if you're the building owner in that case, and you're concerned with the, with the safety of your occupants and your employees. Um, I think you said this during the presentation. Uh, first thing to do is to call a, a qualified HVAC contractor. Is, is, that, is that your advice? Either somebody that's qualified. That's, it could be a contractor mm -hmm. if, if they have the experience. Uh, I will recommend a, a, an engineer, professional, uh, whether it be an architect or, or a professional engineer is probably your, your best bet. Uh, I didn't have to go too far to find someone. I uh, just looked in the mirror and I found them. But uh, it, it, it behooves everybody to really take a look at their buildings, uh, whether you're the owner, whether you're the operator, the employer. Uh, it's very important. It's very important to look at this. Uh, and it's a very serious thing. I mean, it, it's, it is uh, something that, that is hurting people and, and killing people. And if there's something that you can do as a building owner, I think you have a responsibility to do it. The building owner or an employer, either one. And then for the for the homeowners who are looking to upgrade their systems, um, if they're interested in one of these UVGI systems, 
Um, go ahead and order the part now. Order the part now. Huge backlog. Huge. I waited over a month for the, for the ones in my office. I got lucky with the ones in my house. I knew, I knew a local distributor, and he had a few in stock, but I took the last ones he had. I mm -hmm. took four. I, you know, I, I, the last ones he had, I took. And yeah. $125. Right. That's what that like the whole kit. It comes with a whole saw and everything. It, mm -hmm. It's it's nothing. In the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. Uh yeah, it's your house, it's it's your family, and you know, you haven't had issues before. But you know, for $125, have the peace of mind and have a little bit cleaner environment. I mean, it, it's it's a no-brainer. To me, it was it was a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, that that really is all the questions that we have for the program, unless we have any, any others that trickle in here in the, in the next few seconds. Um, Renee, thank you so much, you know, not only for being here, but for preparing this, this was an excellent program. Um, for everybody who's still on the line, uh, we hope to see you in coming weeks. If you have any questions after you get off, if you'd like to talk to Renee or somebody else at our, at our firm, um, please email us at inquiries at robsonforensic.com. We can always follow up with this after the fact. Um, Renee, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care, guys.